Hi, and welcome to the Save It For Parts channel, and welcome back to The Sandbar, our homemade DIY speakeasy carved out of Jordan sandstone. If you're confused about all this, I have some earlier videos where we're excavating all this room here out of the sandstone using power tools. Now, I've touched a little bit on sandstone geology in some of those prior videos, but we've never really gotten into what makes up sandstone, what makes it so easy to carve out while staying stable, and what else is it useful for? Now out here at Sandland, we are technically mining, although in our case, the final product is the empty space. We're basically throwing away all of the sand that we mine out of here and just using the empty space as a cool spot to hang out. But there are local mines that actually want this sand for something. Historic ones that used to mine this out for things like glass and casting and whatnot. And then more modern mines that extract the sandstone for things like oil fracking. Now, as I've said, I'm not a geologist, and I can't really even play one on YouTube very well. All of my geology knowledge comes from Wikipedia or these really outdated books from my great-grandfather, who actually was a mining engineer. These books are fun, but they're a little outdated. So I'll do my best when talking about sandstone and geological stuff, but if I get it wrong, I do apologize. If you live in Minneapolis, St. Paul, or in the Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa region, you might be familiar with sandstone already. It makes up a lot of the white bluffs along the Mississippi River. And mostly what you're seeing along the river is more of this color, this very white, uh, uniform sandstone. That's typically St. Peter sandstone. And right now I'm in Jordan sandstone, as I said, which has a lot more color variation. And the layering gives us a hint of how this sandstone was formed. Uh, this is all basically fossilized beach sand from millions of years ago. So once upon a time, this was all underwater or on a beach, and the sand would be deposited kind of layer by layer and then be built up over time. And over millions of years, as the pressure from the material overhead pressed down on it, it compressed all of it into stone, into rock. I've shown in some other videos how this is actually different from beach sand. You can't just brush it away like sand, it's actually a rock, and we have to use power tools to knock this out when we're tunneling. Let's take a look around the tunnels and check out some of the features that we find in the Jordan sandstone. As we go through the tunnels, you notice a lot of banding in the sandstone. And we get these red layers, these yellowish layers, these whitish layers. There's just a lot of different layers in here. In fact, there's even some layers of clay, which you can see out here. So we're now in the donut room. And you can see that really dramatic band around the top of that darker material. And then another bit of it comes in here. It's almost like a lens of some sort. Now, this is all ancient beach sand. So we're essentially inside of a fossilized beach. And I think that these different colors are just kind of different layers of sand dunes or sand formations that were laid down. We haven't found any actual fossils in this. I think if there were any, they'd be pretty fragile and they'd probably just break when we dig through the sand. I've been playing with this ultraviolet or black light because uh, you can supposedly see different minerals with it. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing a lot of interesting things in the sandstone with the UV light. Now, as we've dug our tunnels, we've come across these uh, iron formations or concretions. They seem to be almost like little iron balls or marbles. They're much, much harder than the surrounding sandstone, and they actually uh, shoot some sparks off the tools when you hit them with the chisel. I'm not 100% sure what they are. We're gonna take some of those home and investigate them a little bit. Here you can see some more of these little concretion things sticking out of the wall. And they seem to show up in very specific layers of the sandstone. So it seems like they were all deposited at a very specific time in the geological period. While Sandland is definitely artificial, we've got some diggers working to make it look more like a natural cave. Particularly this section is actually modeled after a limestone cave in the region. As I've shown before, here are some of the tools that we use to chip out the sandstone and make our tunnels. And then of course we have a bunch of safety gear. Here we have some of the buckets and shovels and wagons that we use to haul the sand. I've shown that hauling process in other videos. I don't really want to repeat too much in this video, since I really want to focus on the geology of the sandstone in this one. Here are some of the little iron concretions that we've dug out pretty recently. I'm going to take these home and see if I can cut some in half or polish them up or figure out more about what they are. Here's some more of those iron balls that people have been collecting over the years. Got uh, quite a bunch of them in here. Here we've got a couple examples of chunks of raw sandstone pulled straight out of the ground at Sandland. This one is a little whiter. This is closer to St. Peter's sandstone, although this has come from the Jordan Formation. This one is a little darker or reddish, might have a little bit more iron content in it. 
And then this is a quite heavy, uh, what we've been calling concretions. And we think there's some more iron content in these, although we're not really sure what makes up these little nodules. Now, none of these really seem to affect a compass, so they don't seem to have a significant amount of iron in them. Even this concretion or nodule doesn't make the compass needle move at all. Now you can see these first two chunks of sandstone, if you put any pressure or effort into them, they just crumble, they break apart, and they turn back into sand, which is exactly what we're doing in the tunnels with the tools. We're smashing away at the sandstone rock, we're turning it into sand, and then we can haul that out and end up with tunnel space behind. Now this guy takes a little more effort to do anything with. I'm going to see what happens if I try to crush it with my multi-tool here. I've put quite a bit of force into that and I still can't break it. It's acting like a metal. Now even though we suspect this darker red sandstone has some iron content in it, it doesn't really seem to react to a magnet. I can't pick up any of the sand particles with the magnet. And the same with this white sandstone. The magnet doesn't pick up any of these particles. The magnet also doesn't seem to stick to this nodule at all. It's also not electrically conductive. Now as iron oxidizes or rusts, it does lose some of its magnetic properties. Now these chunks of rust I dug up in the yard still are slightly attracted to a magnet, but they haven't been down there for millions of years like those little balls have. I brought some samples back to my science lab. And by science lab, I mean some obsolete microscope junk that we got for 20 bucks at University Surplus. I've also got this more modern, if optically questionable, microscope from Axeman for $6. So between the museum pieces and this thing, we should be ready for some real scientific rigor. Alright, here we have some St. Peter's sandstone. The uh, grains are very small and very rounded. Here's some Jordan sandstone, also very rounded grains, but larger than the St. Peter sandstone grains. Now here's that reddish Jordan sandstone under the same magnification. You can see that the sand grains themselves are actually clear or white, just like the other ones. But they've got kind of this reddish, dirty powder or coating on them. Alright, so this little cell phone microscope is actually pretty cool. It's a little more complicated than I thought. It's got this whole uh, focusing unit and light unit. And then you have to put your microscope right up onto your sample. But that's actually really cool. That's uh, a little bit easier to use than the legitimate microscope that I had. So here we're looking at the St. Peter sandstone grains. And here's some of those whitish Jordan sandstone grains. Again, very similar physical structure, just larger than the St. Peter. And then here's the reddish Jordan sandstone, which is, again, basically just dirty sand. So here's a look at some solid sandstone versus the loose sand that we were looking at earlier. This is what the wall looks like before we start hitting it with the tool. This is the solid form of the sandstone. We're going to use the same 15 power microscope. And you can see that it's basically just sand loosely cemented together. It doesn't take much effort to smash this out and have the sand turn into just sand particles. But it is still strong enough to hold together as a rock in its raw form when we haven't smashed at it yet. Alright, and then finally, here's the surface of one of those strange iron marbles or concretions. Since it is a rounded surface, it's kind of hard to get a good solid look at the thing. We're probably going to have to slice this in half and look at what a flat piece looks like. Let's see what it takes to cut one of these in half. Oh, apparently it's too much for this little grinding wheel. Let's try a diamond wheel. I have hardly made a scratch on the surface of this thing. Well, nothing seems to cut through this thing. Let's see if we can just shatter it. So here's what these things look like on the inside. They're kind of a silvery gray, shiny metallic interior. And they definitely still look like metal in there. Here's the flattest surface I could get under that 15 power phone microscope. I'll take some still photos and throw them up on the screen here just because those might be a little easier to see than looking at the phone screen. With that sort of rusty exterior. And there's the broken edge. And here's the inner surface. There's definitely some different colors of material inside of these. And again, here's right along that fractured edge. And the interior of these things is not electrically conductive either. 
All right, so just what are these little things? They're not magnetic, they're not conductive, they still seem like metal on the inside, but they don't have a lot of metal properties that I would expect if they really are iron concretions. Now again, there are certain iron oxides that have lost their magnetic properties. So hematite is a naturally occurring iron oxide and is actually an important iron ore. Now Wikipedia does say that hematite is electrically conductive, although it's not attracted to a magnet. So I don't know if these are pure hematite or some mixture of that and something else. Now apparently out in Utah in the Navajo sandstone, there are things just like this that are known as Moki marbles. And they even have uh, genders for the different shapes. They call the flying saucer one here a female marble, and the spherical one a male marble. And apparently these have applications and uses in various Native American rituals and legends and whatnot. Now the ones out in Utah tend to be sandstone core with a hematite crust. Now these are not exactly the same. These seem to be the same material all the way through, or at least the ones I've cracked open. Now recently NASA has discovered something like this on Mars. Uh, the ones they found on Mars they think are solid iron oxide all the way through, so closer to these than to the Moki marbles. And they're actually using that as an indicator of possible past water activity and possible life on Mars, so that's pretty cool. On a very tenuous and probably unrelated note, there is a large meteor or asteroid crater in this region. It's called the Rock Elm Disturbance. It's mostly unnoticeable from the surface these days, although scientists and geologists have found all kinds of evidence for it in the geologic record. And this asteroid or meteor did hit around the same time that our sandstone at Sandland was forming, although we've had a couple geologists look into it, and they've said it's, it's very unlikely that these are related in any way to that. The most likely explanation for how these little guys are formed is that minerals precipitated out of seawater millions of years ago and formed these kind of molecule by molecule, almost like a crystal or a geode. And again, very similar formations have been found in sandstones all over the world, not just here, not just in Utah, but almost everywhere you have sandstone, you get something like these little guys. Now Washington University describes hematite concretions as formed in sedimentary rocks like limestone or sandstone, and these form by the precipitation of iron oxide, probably out of seawater. They go on to say that while these hematite concretions are rich in iron, they do not attract a simple magnet. And they do mention that these are frequently mistaken for meteorites because of their appearance and weight. Apparently back in the early days of settlement, people did find little chunks of iron, and there were some open pit and even underground mines in central Wisconsin. None of them were very successful, and once the hard rock iron mines up north opened up, these little surface operations were pretty much abandoned. Now the sandstone itself is still actively mined today for things like fracking, as I mentioned, and other uses like glass and casting. Can we do anything with our sand at Sandland? Possibly. I've done some experiments in other videos where we try to solidify it, make the sand back into a sandstone or building material. I've also tried doing some aluminum casting in other videos using sand from Sandland, although my aluminum smelter never quite works right. The sand is also great to throw in your driveway or sidewalk or steps in the winter. It gives you a little bit of extra traction when it's icy. I guess we could use these guys for something like cannonballs in a small cannon. Otherwise, they're just kind of cool little decorations. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this very amateur dive into the geology of Sandland and some of our more interesting geological features. Stay tuned for more digging, more excavating, more tunneling, and maybe more geology stuff if I learn more about it or if we bring out a real geologist to check things out. Make sure to like and subscribe if you don't want to miss those future updates. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.